Anyone else getting some uh, Togoro vibes from this man? Because when I saw him in this episode, and then after thinking about how I've been re-watching Yu Yu Hakusho, I'm like, this man, this man looks exactly like Togoro. I'm like, what the hell? Like, was he inspired, like his design or whatever? Let's talk about Sagawa for a second. You know, our main villain of Kokoku. I love how his entire mentality and how he is able to use these powers, for instance, being able to have extreme speed, strength, and the ability to do things that he normally could never do, is all thanks to him shredding the line of his mentality to where he's like perfect self-control, thinking perfect of himself, like self-confidence, to the point of where he feels like he just wants to die and he doesn't belong. Despair or whatever, if you want to summarize that side, and I like that. I like how this fan is having to tread this like certain line within himself just to be able to achieve this level of strength. It's kind of like he reached enlightenment in a way. It's like he's like, you know, went to Buddha, he's reached enlightenment, and now he's let go of everything, all worldly desires and all that, and he's basically like a perfect, a perfect unity within himself. That's kind of how you can view the entire situation with him in this episode. But getting right into it, though, the reason why I like his character so much is because he has not lost what a lot of villains lose when they obtain power and strength. Normally, when villains get stronger or they change form or whatever, usually they forget what got them there in the first place. For instance, their intellect, their mind, you know, what drove them to get this far. And usually they start going crazy, they just want more power, and they're stupid, but Sagawa isn't that. He is not a stupid individual. Even though he's gotten all this power, he is not doing stupid plays. He's not doing things that just don't make sense. He is experimenting, which this has been a part of his character since he was established. He is someone that wants to know more about stasis, the world of the stalled, and all that. He wants to know everything about it, and so he is constantly experimenting. So when the episode starts off, and you see him like slowly slaughtering everybody that's a part of his culture, and all that like it's nothing, it fits within character because number one, he needs to test things. He wants to test his level of strength, his reaction time, if he, you know, is bending by the rules of the specters in the world. For instance, will he attack individuals that try to attack the stalled? I mean, he wants to know. And so I do like this aspect of this episode of how he was trying to figure out if he really was his own man or if he was being controlled. He was constantly trying to figure that out. And that's what made me really appreciate his character because he's definitely so someone that just has this cold, calm, and calculating personality, and it fits so well with Kokoku, and that is why I have been enjoying these episodes, even though when you look at this episode, there isn't really a whole lot going on, I'm not gonna lie, and I could see many uh, actually looking at this episode and saying it's very slow, boring, and maybe it's nothing really going on at all, but personally, I like this episode for how slow it took itself, and how it's slowly establishing Sagawa as a character, and what he wants to do. Majima, she apparently Apparently has powers. Yeah. So she's actually able to not move objects in the world of stasis. And so what this means is, is like, okay, let's say there's a, a floating board right in front of me. Okay. I have like this floating board and all that. And she can jump on top of it and she cannot, you know, move it down. Like, normally objects in the world of the stasis, if you press it, it starts moving. We've seen this multiple times throughout, you know, the series. But Majima, somehow, when she interacts with something, she can somehow make it to where she won't move the object. So she could stand on top of floating objects that don't really make much sense at all. It's kind of like she completely isolates herself from the world of the, you know, stasis, and she doesn't make it, you know, move at all. It's very weird, a very unique power, and in a lot of ways, it makes me wonder exactly how is this power going to be implemented in the future episodes. Because when I think about it, her power is useful, but at the same time, how much control does she really have when it comes to that power? Because here, let me give a couple of details here. See, her power allows her not to have anything move when she interacts with it. So that makes me question if something was, you know, to come flying at her. Let's say, like, someone threw, like, a fence at her, like we saw Sagwa doing in this episode. If a fence was being thrown at her and, like, it slightly made contact with her, like, as soon as it made contact, could she will it not to move? And if that is definitely the case, that would mean that she could actually protect herself from all bodily harm, unless it comes to a real physical person. For instance, a real person that moves around, she can't stop them, but if the regular objects and all that that are not tied to people with specters within them, I wonder if any objects coming in is she would be able to stop them before they did any damage to her body. That would be a very, very cool ability if that is what it can do, but I have no idea if Kokoku 
is willing to elaborate on that ability or if it was just showcasing that that Majima is very different from everybody else and she has abilities just like you know Juri, the grandpa and all of that so we'll see where that goes but I just wanted to talk about my assumption of what maybe her ability could potentially do. The father as I've said he, he's probably going to be the final villain or he's going to do something very crusty at the end that's just going to be like are you serious my dude. Um, the man is in this episode, he doesn't have, like, a big spotlight for the main events, like, for instance, Sagwa and all that, but what he does do in this episode once again shows another layer to him that he is not a good person. For instance, you have it to where the, you know, little nephew and all that of Jury, you know, he wants a toy, you know, he's gonna get a toy and all that, and he gets up to the cast register and all that, and he's like, oh, I want to get this, and apparently the, you have it to where the father's like, hey, look, you know, I can't pay, you know, she can't scan it right now, this is a one-time thing, let's just go. Basically, he was trying to say, let's steal this, let's just go, you don't have to pay for it, let's get out of the store, but the little boy's like, no, I don't want to do that, I don't want it then, so he's gonna turn around and basically put it back up, because he didn't want to steal, he was morally right, like, he knew it wasn't right to do if he he was to just walk out with it without paying and so that shows that the boy has a good moral conscience while the father he lied to the kids like okay okay here I'll put money on you know the table right there I'll leave money but then as soon as the boy's like yay and he started leaving the father grabbed the money and walked off so once again it doesn't matter he stole so the boy doesn't know it he doesn't know that it's actually stolen but even then though the father did something very scummy and stole this toy and didn't tell the boy about it and all that so it just shows what type of character he is but on top of that as well he does come up with a logical conclusion about why he doesn't really have any role to play or why he doesn't have a say in the matter when it comes to destroying the stone or not which I do like that aspect about his character he states in this episode that he lacks influence which makes a lot of sense because when he says he lacks a lot of influence it makes sense when he starts explaining that he is a father that sent his own daughter out that's unmarried to go and take care of the whole business, but Sagawa would ever treat the Master Stone, save the, you know, her brother, basically stuff like that. He realizes that from his position, he looks like someone lazy that can't do anything, and he realizes that's probably how people view him, and he's like, obviously, I just don't have influence. So somehow I need to get everybody un to understand that I am a good guy, and I have a lot of influence, and then I can do things. For instance, he can have a say in the matter to where the stone won't be destroyed. So that was an interesting aspect about the episode of Kokoku, and when it came to the father. Let's talk about uh, Sagawa and his transformation. So the man started to beef up. Like, he became very swole for a moment in this episode, and the reason for it was because he was eating food. And this food that he was eating was slowly making his body get buffer and buffer and had to kind of calm himself and kind of recreate himself within his own mind and body. And then he shed the excess skin to make it to where the specter was fed. It had the energy. And as we know, the heralds, they have a certain limited amount of energy and then they die as well. So this does prove that the man does need to continuously eat. He probably needs to eat a lot, a lot more than a normal average person if you want to get to, if he wants to continue doing the stuff he has been doing. For instance, going at insane speeds, being able to lift things or, you know, throw things that are very, very heavy, most likely he's going to continuously have to get more energy if he wants to do stuff like this, and which is why he has such a big appetite in this episode. So the grandpa, apparently he is about to get ejected out of the world of stasis, and the reason for it is because Sagwa got his blood. Now... We know for a fact the grandpa doesn't know much about stasis. This has already been established, so it's not like it came out of nowhere, okay? It's very obvious he didn't know everything about the world. And it makes sense. You you lose knowledge over time and all that. When you pass things down from generation to generation, sometimes cer certain knowledge is lost. And it makes a lot of sense. And so the grandpa obviously doesn't know everything, especially of probably how to enter or leave the world of stasis. But it is revealed that you don't necessarily need to be there for you to get ejected out of stasis. With the stone, when he put his blood in the stone the first time it activated, as we know, there was this big ball that popped up, and we had it to where all the family members were making hand contact, physical contact, when they got put into the world. That the only reason why everybody was brought in without putting their blood into the stone was thanks to the grandpa, you know, making sure they had physical contact with him. So that does let us know that you don't necessarily need to be there. So if someone gets rid of the stone, and they want you gone, they can just put your blood in it, and then they eject you out no matter how far away you are. And I do wonder if somehow the grandpa can fight it off and not be, you know, taken out of the world of stasis if he uses his, you know, Aegis. So, like, if he uses Aegis and stops it, 
maybe he might be able to ground himself where he's not ejected, but even then, though, that's quite crazy that you don't necessarily need to be there to be ejected out. I hope the grandpa doesn't die, but as I've said many times already while reviewing this series, it does look like these type of characters do end up dead, and I could definitely see him dying in the process. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoy my content, please subscribe. If you like this video, please leave a like, and I love you guys. Have a wonderful day or night wherever you live. Please be safe. Chibi out.